Welcome to this presentation. Um, this one, again, is it's a little bit different for me because this is something that we're going to be really focusing on some of the more softer skills and the things that, you know, the, the, um, what my, uh, what, what some of the people that are successful, um, that are having success in the data science space are doing to get jobs, are doing to, to build their careers. And it's not necessarily going to be focused on code or some of the things that I've traditionally presented on in the past. Um, so the first thing to get across here in this presentation is that organizations have a huge need out there right now for people who can work with data. Um, the, and you'll also notice that this, this, uh, or this presentation has kind of an aquatic theme. Um, the idea here is that organizations are submerged in data, hashtag drowning in data. Um, that couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, the, um, or, or I should say that that couldn't be more more uh, of the truth, because all of these organizations right now are at a at kind of a, a massive uh, issue right now where they've got all of this information and, they're, and they really um, need to be able to extract insights from that and they need special people like you and me to be able to help them with that. So um, the the real thing here though is what we're going to be focused on is is uh, this idea of becoming a data scientist without having a degree. Um, and when I say without having a degree, it doesn't mean you don't have any degree. Um, most, most companies still expect some sort of minimum requirement of, of probably a four year degree. But I'm, I'm, what I'm saying here is you don't need to have a degree that like a PhD in data science in order to become a data scientist. In fact, um, you'll see a lot of the, the people that, that we um, go through in this when we do our case studies have degrees in marketing, have degrees uh, or backgrounds in higher education, have backgrounds in kind of these non-traditional areas. So um, to get started though, first I'm gonna focus on uh, kind of what, what's going on with organizations. And the reason here is that, you know, we could focus on, the, on us as developing ourselves, but if we don't know what we're developing for, then, this, then, it, then it's kind of pointless. So um, the, the, uh, the, the challenge here or the, the thing that's um, or the opportunity that's presenting itself now is that we're now in this new era. So traditionally in the past, and I'm talking the recent past, degrees have uh, were kind of the, um, uh, the gold standard per se to get a job. Companies, you know, uh, I know when I got my first job, it was uh, back in 2004 uh, or 2006. And as long as you had a degree from a reputable institution, you, you were pretty much a, a, a lock in. You know, the interview was kind of a, a second, you know, stepping stone. But as long as you had a degree, you were, you were pretty much good to get a job. You fast forward now to 2020 and beyond, and we're seeing a complete change. It's much, much more difficult. You can't just walk into a company and expect to get a job. Even if you have a degree from Harvard or MIT or some of these you know, really reputable institutions, it's not a guarantee that you're going to get a job. And the other thing is, is that companies are putting a lot more emphasis on the skills that you bring to the table. They're wanting to test you out. Um, they're giving you take-home exams. They really want to see what you bring to the table and what you can offer them and if that's a good fit. So we're seeing this big shift, and that's actually an opportunity because this means that you don't need to necessarily spend all of your time and money on getting degrees. Um, you can combine domain experience uh, with, with um, online training, and this can help you get your foot in the door just and, and be on the same level as somebody who has spent a whole lot of money and time getting, getting degrees. So uh, the key here that we're going to focus on is this shift and what we can do in order to maximize this opportunity for ourselves. So um, this is just kind of a little bit more proof of what I'm talking about. And we're starting to see this, um, especially with these bigger tech companies like Amazon and Google and Microsoft, where what they're doing out there is they're now transitioning from the traditional, you know, uh, sending their, their people um, off to get training through colleges and universities to actually uh, bypassing that traditional college approach in favor of alternative training options. So uh, while this is primarily geared to people who already have jobs within Amazon, Google, 
you can see that the writing is on the wall where these uh, colleges and universities are not being as, as necessary as in the past. And I only see this further and further transitioning. It may take a while before degrees in general are phased out, but, or, and that may never happen completely. But I think what we can see is, is that these companies that need skills immediately aren't going to send their, their uh, employees off to take two years to, to get a, a degree in, in, uh, in data science. That's just not the reality. What they're really look, looking for is people to obtain micro courses or micro information that solve specific tasks that can help them specifically with the projects that they're working on. So they're not looking for you know, people to get these long-term degrees. What they want is people to get the skills that they need, take a month or two months or, or three months, develop themselves, and then immediately apply that to the projects that they're working for or working on. Okay, so now that we know a little bit about what's going on out there, let's talk about what's going on and where people are having some, some successes. And what I'm going to do here is I'm really going to be focusing on some case studies of people that I know um, that have kind of gone through this process. And we're going to talk about three different pillars. So we're going to do five case studies and we're going to do three pillars. And we're going to show how some of these case studies line up with these different pillars. And um, again, this is what successful people are doing. Hashtag learning from others. Okay. So the three pillars that we're going to see, and this is just kind of um, me bucketing into three different, um, th three different groups uh, of, of what I see that successful people who are really developing themselves in this new era of education and able to, to really succeed by either getting jobs or, or developing themselves. So there's kind of a, a little bit of a process and uh, these three pillars kind of kind of line up in a sequence. So the way that I see this, these successful people kind of organizing their learning is they first do projects. And that's really important because the project-based learning approach is the complete opposite of these unit, what these university degree programs really focus on where degree programs traditionally have focused on providing, you know, a wide range of skills, you know, hoping that se several of the skills, you know, line up with their future job. Uh, what these students are doing is the exact opposite. They're focusing on these projects that they know will uh, be applied directly to their jobs or their future jobs. So they're learning how to, how to solve these business problems, but on a micro scale where it's not whole degree, but rather, really kind of focused on you know, taking a month or so and learning a skill that they're going to be able to, uh, that's directly transferable. So when they do that, as they do these projects, they really develop themselves and that aligns very closely with that job that they're seeking. The next thing that they do is they um, work on the interview. So once you have these skills and you've kind of gained that confidence because you, you know a lot about um, what you're going to need to be able to do once you get on into the job, um, then what they're doing is they're showing that they can solve business problems. And they're, and they're specifically focusing on that aspect in the interview versus some of the other uh, aspects like you know trying to memorize interview questions and this and that. What they're doing is really focusing on listening to what the, the problem is that they're being asked to solve in the interview. And what they're doing is then uh, seeing how that they can transfer their response to the business objectives of what they're being asked for. And this, and what this does is it shows how they can be an asset to that company by really focusing on the business. So when they do this, combine their skills that they've developed through projects and this kind of interviewing technique where they're focusing on business value, that's, that's them gaining um, entrance into that company. They're getting their foot in the door. The company really appreciates that because it, it tends to show an alignment between what the, what the person is bringing to the table that's being interviewed and what the company needs which is to be able to solve these business challenges. So once they do that, then um, they get on the job and the jobs, you know, they're, they're, they're 
their learning process isn't done yet. What they're doing is they're continuing to learn more and they're continuing to repetitively apply these, um, uh, these, these skills, these new skills to produce business results. They're doing this time and time again. Okay. So those are the three pillars. Um, the first pillar that we're going to focus on is projects. So we want to know how you can become successful from learning to do projects. Well, um, the idea here is that when you complete projects, so this is an example of an application that you might build. When you complete this project, you learn a lot of micro skills that are directly transferable to a business. You learn application development, you learn how to work with time series, geographic data, you learn all sorts of things that are related to data science that um, are kind of these micro skills that really help your business. So uh, here's a few case studies. The first one is Herbert McCalla. And he is a business analyst with Florida Power and Light. He, his key accomplishment is he built a predictive forecasting application that helps Florida Power and Light understand battery demand. So that's something that's very important to that business. And what he was able to do was to develop this application here where we're seeing that he's focused on a business problem. He's di digested it into these kind of micro things that need to happen in order to be able to solve that problem. They need a time series prediction here. They need a geographic prediction here. And they have to be able to you know, run these models overnight. So he's had to acquire a lot of different micro skills in order to be able to provide a solution to that business. Now, further, just the act of building this application has now gained him not only a bunch of skills, but also something that he can showcase when he, if, if he ever needs to um, showcase his portfolio. So he's, he's beginning to build a project portfolio where he's got it now an application in his tool belt that he can, and he, and he may not, this, this may be something that he can't share with other companies or, or, you know, but it's something he can talk about in an interview and he can talk about intelligently because he built it from the ground up. So this is something that's important. You, he's developing his portfolio. He's also developing his project experience. Okay. So that was the first case study. The second case study here is Raj Kumar, and he's a data scientist at C1X Inc. And his key accomplishment is he, just this year, got first place in the 2020 Shiny competition. And that's a competition that I think had like over 250 entrants. And uh, he got, he was one of the top submissions. He got first place. And I think there was like two or three people who got first place um, in some different categories. And he um, ended up getting one of the first place positions. So one of the things that this is doing, it's, it's again an example of a project, but he was able to take kind of a concept that he had been thinking about and was able to execute it. Um, so he built this application called Git Discover. And what this does is it has to do all sorts of kind of micro skills again, connect up to an API, which is the GitHub API. It fetches data. It has to, he has to know um, Shiny, which is the main uh, competition. And that's how he built this application here. Um, and he had have a lot of different micro skills in order to be able to do calculations and things and, and, um, and a lot of uh, user interface or U, UX design, user experience design. So he had to really learn a lot of micro skills. Again, these skills are super valuable to organizations because uh, while they may not be trying to build a Git discoverer application, what they're trying to do is build applications that they can, business applications that other people that are non-technical in that organization can use and this is a, a perfect example of he's got the skills now that that company may know they need and they just need to tweak some of the things that he's working on and give them the right project. So again, Raj has now a, uh, an app that he's built. He's learned a lot of micro skills and he's um, creating this portfolio for himself that now makes him really marketable out there. Okay. So we've talked about the projects and those are the things that kind of build your skill sets. But what do effective people do 
once they get into the interview. And um, this, this is actually really interesting. So what they're doing here is kind of transitioning actually away from the talking about the data science. So they're not necessarily focusing on the tools that they learn and the skills that they've developed in the interview process, but rather what they're doing is they're focusing now on how to solve business problems. And what, they're, what the idea here is they're demonstrating that they have the skills that that business needs. Um, because the businesses, as we know, are really focused on trying to improve their results, whether that's increasing revenue, uh, whether that's you know, giving a better customer experience. They're able to, in the interview process, focus on what are, is the key metrics that that company is looking for and how to communicate effectively and provide responses to some of these interview questions. So um, we'll also see how this thing called the business science problem framework kind of pokes its head in this interviewing process. It's, it's really interesting. Um, so the first one is Jennifer Cooper. And uh, her key accomplishment is just this year, she got the VP of strategic analytics and auto risk uh, from the JP Morgan Chase uh, organization. So she just got this uh, amazing job, uh, something that she's really been looking for. And, uh, and it's really kind of a boosted her career. And I know sh uh, she's super excited about it. Um, her background is not necessarily in data science. She, um, she has a degree in marketing. She also has her MBA, um, but she doesn't have a PhD or anything in data science. So her, her big accomplishment during this interviewing process was really, um, so she had, a, had this take home exam. And this isn't uncommon. I mean, it, it, it's pretty common in the, in the interview process from what I've heard from, from talking with people is that they get these kind of take home exams. And this is, again, an example where that company is testing you out. They want to see if, um, how you react to their specific business problems or problems that are similar to theirs. And they want to see what response you give to them. So that response, um, what she was able to do was, was quite interesting. So her project um, or mini project take home exam was uh, to do an analysis of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau data. And what she, was, what she did was she followed this process called the Business Science Problem Framework. And what she was able to do was uh, develop an, a, um, a report that really showcased an in-depth knowledge of what that business um, was interested in, um, some of the insights from the data that they could take actions on, and how they could really align kind of the business objectives with information that they could take that, that she was able to extract from the data. Um, and this was really powerful because that company, uh, JP Morgan, they ended up fast tracking an offer to her and she actually had I think she was in a competitive scenario where she had multiple job offers at the same time. So um, this was, this was uh, an example of how her ability to really focus on the business needs and, the, and, the, and extracting business value was really important to that data science interview position. Okay. The next one here is Masataki. So this is the fourth case study, I believe. And um, Masataki's key accomplishment here is that he was able to get a data science position at a top five consulting firm uh, named Deloitte, and um, he's got a background in higher education. So um, Masataki's experience was almost identical to Jennifer's. So in the job interview, when he was uh, interviewing with Deloitte, what he was doing was um, really listening to what the interviewer's questions were, and he was able to, uh, in his words, draw their attention to formulate insights for, from analytics for driving business value. So he, again, was utilizing um, the, the same framework that Jennifer used, uh, and he was able to really kind of say, hey, you know, this is the question that I'm getting. These are the key things that that business is interested in. This is the step-by-step -step approach that we can go through in order to answer some of these questions and provide insights. And this is what I would do in order to be able to solve that problem for you. And the interviewer, um, it, it ended up being a, a success because 
he was able to land that job. Um, and I know he's been there for, I believe, a year or so now. And I think, I believe he's doing very well with it. So these are the key things. Um, when you get into that interview, it's not necessarily about all the tools and techniques you've learned over the, over the uh, you know, over your education. You know, yes, that's important but it's really kind of focusing more on the business value, the objectives, your ability to um, talk in terms of language that other business people are going to be able to understand and communicate that value effectively. Okay, so now moving on to the third pillar. So once you get that job that you've been wanting, what are you gonna do? You know, you've, you've just got it. Here's, here's a newsflash, the work doesn't stop. So you still need to continue learning. You still need to um, continue, uh, and most importantly, you need to apply data science to your work, uh, but you also need to um, solve business problems and, um, and continue learning. And this is a kind of a theme that we'll see in this fifth case study. So this is a Z do. Uh, he is now currently a, a senior data scientist at Synch Synchronous. Um, now, I know he's only been with them for eight months, and previously uh, he worked with another company where um, uh, he what he did was he was able to become a data science with data scientist with that company um, by doing some really innovative work uh, that actually had some very powerful business results. So his key accomplishment was that he reduced costs and increased quality uh, by utilizing some of the data science tools and extracting insights from customers and really being able to showcase um, some of the, the uh, power of data science, which is actually improving healthcare costs or reducing healthcare while increasing quality. So, so it's two big benefits. Um, and normally though, you don't see those going hand in hand. Um, his background's also in information systems. So while he's kind of got a technical background, he is no, by no means a, a data science, uh, uh, doesn't have a degree in data science. So what he did was he, um, and this is one of the reports that he shared on LinkedIn, he shared with me, uh, he developed this really powerful report using some of the techniques of clustering and being able to understand how to segment customers and then being under, able to understand how to dive into some of these customer segments and showcase what's going on. So what he um, did was he created this, these solutions that improved patient care while reducing costs. And this is the idea behind why these organizations are investing in you. So they've now decided to hire you on. Uh, what, what they're looking for is they want a return on their investment. For, so they're investing in you. And, what, and this is exactly what people like Z are continuously able to do. So he was, he's not able to do this just once, but he's able to repeatedly continue to add value, add value, add value to those organizations by utilizing these tools on different problems. Okay, so let's recap. Let's bring it back in. Um, the three pillars that I saw when I was reviewing some of these case studies, number one, how are they learning? It's by doing projects. So you want to be able to uh, solve these business problems and that's developing you, but it's also developing your portfolio. Number two, is once you get into the interview. So now you've got the chops to be able to communicate and be able to try and land that job. Well, uh, what you wanna be able to do is you wanna be able to focus on what's really important to that business. And it's not necessarily being able to talk about machine learning and data science tools, but really what it is, is it's being able to showcase how you can utilize the skills that you have specifically for driving business value. And then once you get on the job, your responsibility now has become that co company is now invested in you. What they want is a return on their investment and how you continue to grow your career is by producing time and time again, these results that um, you know, are, are able to drive business value. And when that company sees that, your career takes off because they're going to wanna to invest more and more in you to retain you and to grow your role in that organization. Um, and how do you, how do you keep you know, adding uh, more and more uh, results and how do you continue to get business results time and time again? You'd never stop learning. You always continue learning. Um, it's just kind of, there's no end game to learning. Uh, you have to keep studying. And when you do that, you continue to grow yourself and, you're, and you continue to help your company. Okay, so now let's move on to back to companies. 
Uh, we talked about kind of what these successful people are doing. Uh, now what I want to do is transition into what companies now expect. And surprise, we're focusing on business results. So there's really a four-pronged approach when it comes to digesting what these companies need and how you can position yourself in order to be able to really effectively help these companies. So there's four things. Uh, the first one is problem solving ability. So this is your ability to digest and disseminate that organization's problem and be able to break it down into micro problems that can be solved by you and your, and your team. The second one is actionable insights. So you need to be able to extract something from that problem. You need to be able to provide information, but it can't just be anything. It's gotta be something that the organization can take action on. If they can't take any action on your, or on your information, while it may be interesting, it's virtually useless. So you need to be able to provide results that are going to, that an organization is actually going to be able to, to do something with. The third thing, you need to be able to build applications. And this is something that is kind of relatively new, and I know a lot of data science programs out there aren't really talking about it, but it's so, so critical, is that the idea in most organizations is that the data science group can't really scale reports and Excel files. What they can do, though, is they can, ex they can scale out their data science through applications, and that's what organizations want because they don't want the data scientists making decisions they want the people that are responsible for the different areas like marketing and sales and manufacturing, them to be able to take the information and process it and then make decisions. And that's what business applications do. They, they scale out the data science. Um, and then finally, they want business value. So this is something that should be relatively apparent by now. Uh, the end goal and how you are going to accelerate your career with that company is by providing that company business value. All right, so let's talk about the first one, um, problem solving ability. This uh, is one of the biggest kind of uh, misconceptions about data science is that it's all about the data science. That, in my opinion, is, is, uh, is, is incorrect because the data science really powers you to solve the business problems. And what companies really want is it to all be about the business problem. So when you kind of switch that focus from focusing on learning skills and, and you know, learning all of the different machine learning and everything out there um, to really focusing on how you can fit that machine learning and those skills into a, a business problem solving workflow. That's really what becomes very powerful. So one of the things that I promote at business science uh, is how to uh, follow kind of a step-by-step -step approach. And this is a framework that I developed. It's the same framework that Jennifer has, has used and uh, Masataki had used in their interviewing process. And what it does is it kind of takes you through a, a repeatable uh, framework that shows how you integrate a lot of the different data science into um, a, an organization and, and with a focus on generating what's called ROI, that's return on investment. So what that means when you take on a project, how are you gonna be able to deliver ROI with that, that project and, and how would you monitor that, that solution that you deliver? So that's the, business, that's the first thing. Um, problem solving ability, uh, you need to have that, you need to be able to, to provide that. The business science problem framework is one solution that can help you tremendously. And we saw that um, in examples of, of Jennifer and Masataki utilizing it in the interviewing process. The second one, actionable insights. So this is the idea where you can take the business problem and you can take the data that's associated with that business problem and really kind of fine tune it so that way you align the information that you extract from that data uh, along the lines of the business objectives. And when you do that, it's extremely effective in helping those organizations because then they're able to take actions from uh, the information that you're providing them. So the example that we gave previously was with ZDo, where he performed a similar cu clustering analysis where he was able to extract some customer insights and provide a report that showcased how that and recommended how that company that he was working for 
could improve the quality of patient care by focusing on certain uh, patients uh, while reducing their overall uh, ex expenditures on how many uh, patients they're taking on and this and that. So when you do that, that is an example of how you're providing actionable insights to an organization that they can then utilize and improve their financial results from that. Okay. The third one is business applications. So again, this, this goes back to the idea that we can't really scale reports, we can't really scale um, uh, Excel files, um, and it's very difficult also to scale predictive insights unless you have uh, the ability to develop business applications. And what we're seeing in organizations is that there's this tremendous need now to push the decision-making authority down to the, to the lowest level in the organization, which is the people that are actually in charge of the different kind of spots of that organization, like the marketing uh, and the people, that, and even below that, the people that are in charge of specific customers, they need to have information flowing to them in, the for, in a format that they can digest they, um, and companies want them to have predictive insights on demand. So the, how, how you provide that to them is through applications. Um, you can't, again, you don't wanna provide Excel files, you don't wanna be emailing those out left and right, that's just not a, a recipe for success. Uh, rather, what you wanna be able to do is to build these kind of applications that um, allow that, that uh, information to be scaled out and allow people to interact with your data science without having to actually know data science. So skills that you need in order to be able to do this, you need to be able to connect to databases, to APIs, um, you need to be comfortable working with Amazon, uh, AWS, or co uh, comfortable working with servers or Azure or uh, Google Cloud Platform. And, um, and one of the key technologies here is Shiny, um, which is, is a, a really powerful technology for developing these, these amazing applications very quickly. Okay, and then the final one is business value. So typically what the company is looking for is they wanna see, um, they wanna know how you're measuring success. And they, most importantly, it should be in terms that they are um, very interested in. And we call these key KPIs or key performance indicators. And this is the idea where companies want you to do typically a couple, a handful of different things. You know, they either want you to maximize profit, they want you to increase revenues, they want you to reduce costs, they want you to reduce waste, they want you to, to have some metric. And you need to find, figure out what that metric is that they're concerned with. And then what you need to do is develop your analysis around that metric. And that's one of the things that I teach, um, and that's really important, uh, especially when you're in the interviewing process and you wanna be able to talk in terms that the interviewer, who may not be a data scientist, uh, they may be a business person, uh, you wanna be able to talk and communicate in terminology that they can understand, and you wanna be able to show them that you've got a plan and you know how to go after this type of information, which is really being able to show business value, how you can, how you can extract business value from, from that problem. Okay, so what is the common theme now? I got a question for you guys. Um, what is the common theme of all five of these people here? Uh, there's a, there's a, a couple of common themes. Okay, I'm not seeing any responses here, so I'll, I'll give you, uh, okay, so yeah, Jared Prince, yeah, that, that, is, that, that, is, that is the common theme. There is, they, these are all my students. Um, the other common theme here too, and, I, and that's, that's kind of a, um, you know, I, I want you to understand that, yes, uh, these, these, are, these are my students, these are the people that are taking my courses and my classes, um, but really what they're doing is they're showing, they're doing well for their organization, they're having these successes out there. You know, by all means, they aren't perfect, and uh, I myself am not perfect either. We all suffer from a lot of different challenges, you know, um, learning, uh, whether that those challenges are, you know, thinking that you, maybe it's like imposter syndrome or you never, you never think you'll be able to do this. Um, or it could be, you know, a, a challenge of, Hey, my career is plateauing. 
Uh, I feel like I'm in a rut. Um, they're, they're all kind of working themselves through all of these different challenges in different ways. And they're utilizing data science as a way to help them kind of separate themselves from the pack and really help them get the, you know, take their career, get it on the right track with where they want it to go. And that is the power of learning data science. It's not necessarily that you need a degree in PhD, a PhD in data science to be able to do that. And, and quite often it's more important to have a business background or some sort of background that relates well to the business and then combine that with the data science. And that becomes a really powerful com combination. So we're seeing that in a lot of these. Um, and uh, yes, there are all my students. All I do is I help them kind of learn some of the skills that are going to be able to uh, get them on the right track. Um, so uh, real quick, what I'll do here at the end, before we jump into some questions, uh, I do wanna talk about my five course R track system. This is the system that uh, most of them are taking or they're taking several courses within the system. And uh, it's really designed to help you do all the things that we've just talked about in this presentation. So uh, if you're interested in learning how to kind of go from pure, pure, pure beginning, meaning you've got no background in coding, uh, maybe you've got a little bit of Excel background, uh, this is the program that basically takes you from start to finish. Um, the nice thing about it is you don't have to pick out, you know, all of these different courses or tracks that you want to take. It's a very focused program. Um, with about five to 10 hours per week of coursework, you can complete the entire program. Um, depending on which courses all you uh, plan on taking or if you wanna do all of them, all, all the courses will take you about nine months to complete. But um, it, what it does, and this is the power of it, is it walks you through the beginnings, setting your foundations, which is the, the, what the first course does. It teaches you how to, how to do the coding part but it also, it's, mo it's mainly focused on how do you do these projects? How do you digest the business information? What are the 80-20 tools that you should be focusing on? You don't need to focus on everything. You just need to focus on the most important pieces that are gonna give you the results. So once you learn those, that gives you a solid foundation. And then what you're able to do is start then learning the things that are gonna get you through that interview process. So that's the business science problem framework. That is probably the most important tool that I can think of that allows you to extract value from businesses. Um, so that you learn in the 201 course. And, what, and what's really nice about that course is it takes you through step by step the same consult, because this, this is the consulting framework that I used to use when I worked with all of my Fortune 500 clients and all of these uh, companies. Uh, and even when I did trainings um, at uh, all these, these companies, um, a lot of times I would use this framework to kind of showcase them how they really need to focus themselves on the business um, objectives rather than you know, focusing on applying all of the tools. Um, you, you need to know how to apply the tools, don't get me wrong, but you need to do it in a constrained and a repeatable process, and that's what this gives you. Um, the newest course too on the analytics end is the advanced time series course. So this is a huge demand area that I saw and I've known about it for a while. Um, and I've been in, back when I was uh, working for companies, I was doing a lot of forecasting and time series analysis. So there's now um, a time series component as well. Um, it's called high performance time series. You learn, these are two packages that I've actually developed uh, personally. And um, this third package here is a Luon uh, TS. It's a uh, Python framework. So you learn that in, um, in the analytics courses. And then the last two courses in the system are designed for applications. So you then take all of these data science skills that you've learned and you learn how to package them in a format that your business can handle, which is applications. And the nice thing about applications is once you learn how to do these, you can make these very quickly and then you can deploy them on servers and the rest of your company can interact with them. And then uh, you can automate a lot of the processes that are going on in your business and your business loves automation. So that'll be really powerful. Okay, so that's the courses. Um, 
Before we do questions, David, uh, I do want to do one thing. Uh, I, I just actually yesterday um, got a new uh, student success story, and this one's really cool. I want to share it with everybody. Um, so this is the email, and I have, it, I have his name blacked out here uh, for a reason. He sent, he sent me this on September uh, 10th, I believe, of this year. And he says here, it's been a pleasure to share with you good news. I've recently been offered a job as a machine learning application developer team lead at a Fortune 500 IT firm. He didn't tell me what firm that it was, um, but I, I had a, a, a kind of a, a guess on a couple of different firms that it could be. Um, he, he says here that he worked on R before, but with the help of the great content at the BSU, which is the Business Science University, um, together with the hard work of practicing the concepts, he learned how to implement the same in his day-to-day -day work and make impactful projects. So again, that theme of building himself through projects. Uh, I'm writing you to say how grateful I am for the mentorship. Uh, you've given me over the past few months, having the opportunity to learn from you has made a substantial change in my career. Um, he never imagined that it was, he was going to be able to make this much progress. And he's, it's just, it's showcasing how this content and this information packaged in the right way can really alter somebody's career. So I just got yesterday, I found out who it was. Uh, it's Ran Singh Ray. Um, you may see him in the, uh, I, the business science community. If you're part of the courses, uh, asking questions and contributing, but, uh, he told me, that uh, he got the lead application developer at Accenture. So big top five uh, IT consulting firm. Uh, they're a big name out there and a Fortune 500 firm. So congratulations to Ran Singh. Um, he's doing an awesome job and I'm super excited about the prospects of him and his career. Uh, he's got a really cool position where he's gonna be doing a lot of machine learning and application development and combining all the skills that I've been talking about in this presentation. All right. So, uh, David, uh, we can do some, um, some Q and a and, okay. and let's, um, also provide them the, the black Friday coupon, which is 25% off all of the courses. Okay, great. So just really quick. Um, I put the link to the courses in the chat. Uh, if you go there, you'll see each individual course outline with all the modules in there. Um, so feel free to check those out. Uh, I want to thank, um, there are some existing business science students in the chat. Um, so thanks for being part of uh, this, you know, this webinar and helping out with some of the questions. Um, but yeah, let's answer some questions. So, because I think there, there does seem to be a theme. And the theme revolves around, there's a lot to learn. Where do I start? How do I know what to focus on? And then how do I go from having limited experience to building a portfolio and getting a job. So let's start with those two areas. Okay. So um, let me just rephrase the question. Um, David, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, the, the, the question is, is how do I develop a portfolio? Um, is that one of them? And then also where do I get started? Yeah, but I think more importantly, it's like um, people are feeling uh, overwhelmed with the amount of stuff that's out there. How do I know what to focus on? Mm -hmm. What should I focus on? Yeah. And, and how do I go about getting a job when I'm just a beginner? Yeah. Don't have so, a lot of experience. Yeah. So, so, so one of the challenges with this presentation is I had to really pare down the content to keep it in uh, within the time that I wanted to shoot for. I'm, I'm happy because this, this is like the first presentation I've given that hasn't gone over an hour in a while. Um, but I did have to strip out some of the content. Um, one of the things that I was uh, focusing on that I wanted to focus on, um, was some of the pitfalls and some of the challenges that, that we face as a data scientist. And, um, there's, there's several that we, that we face, um, probably the, uh, the biggest right now. And the one that I, I used to face, um, I know when I was learning, um, was all of the different kind of, I call them like shiny objects, not, not like the programming, like not, not the programming tool shiny. That's, that's really nice. But, um, the, uh, I, I call them kind of like, uh, it's, it's basically distractions. 
And it's how do you focus on the right things? Where should you uh, best dedicate your efforts? And it's really challenging um, because I know when I was learning, it took me probably two or three years to get to the point that um, it should have only taken me probably two or three months to. Um, and that's and that's the problem. That's that's basically you know how how it went back then because there wasn't really good training materials out there. Now, um, when it comes to focusing, uh, here's 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 the uh, the myth and the reality. The the myth is you should be learning everything. The reality is you should be learning probably the the top twenty percent of things that get you the results. And for a beginner, the problem is, is that you don't know what those top 20% of things are. And uh, further, excel, you know, further increasing this problem is the fact that you go on LinkedIn or you go on Twitter and you see a new package being developed or you, get, you see a, you know, somebody talking about TensorFlow and you feel like you need to learn that. And then somebody else you know, says, no, Py, uh, PyTorch is, is better. You know, and then you feel like you need to stop what you're doing. Uh, with TensorFlow and you feel like you need to learn PyTorch Py and then and then finally then you meet somebody like me and I tell you no you shouldn't learn either of those because you need to learn you know the basics first so uh, you know so, so it's kind of like this constant stopping and starting and that really hurts you because it wastes time um, time that you could be if you knew the right way uh, you could get the job faster uh, you could accelerate your career faster um, so from uh, an investment standpoint, you're, you're, uh, you're reducing your rate of return, you're, you're reducing your ROI from learning data science by taking longer to learn it. Um, so how do you go about learning it faster? Well, that's kind of one of the reasons that I developed the business science program is that it streamlines and it focuses you on the 80-20, the 20% that gets you 80% of the results. And it also gives you the tools that businesses actually need and can use that are out there. Now, can, can you learn this on your own? Yes, absolutely. Um, it'll just take you probably seven to 10 years, which is what it took me <laughs> to put it all together. And I've been, you know, I haven't taken really many days off in that seven to 10 year period. Um, but I love it and I'm excited about it. And if you love it and you're excited about it too, and if you're passionate, um, you know, you'll, you'll do what it takes to learn it. Uh, the, probably what's best for your career, the, the program, I would say without a doubt, you know, just take that because that gives you kind of a focused path. But if you're also interested in exploring other things, I mean, there's no, there's no one data science program out there that's ever going to do exactly what you need it to do. So you, the, the key is to get yourself, your foundation set, get yourself on a good path so you can get the job and then once you get the job, keep learning in order to be able to uh, continue to accelerate yourself. Okay, great, great. Um, so Elton was asking, uh, as, a, as a student of statistics, how, how could I prepare myself for a job right after graduation? Uh, what are the main tools I should focus on? So this is a little bit in line with what you were just talking about. So um, if, if you're graduating, you know, the, the key thing is that you want to get a, a, a position as quickly as possible. Um, the, the challenge is going to be that these companies, they really don't, uh, even though you have a degree, you know, they're going to be testing you on certain things. So you need to be comfortable with projects and you need to be comfortable with the interviewing process. So I would focus on those two aspects. Um, we saw how, you know, these, these people, once they learn the business science framework and once they learn how to do um, certain things and really get the interviewer to take the, um, to understand that they've, they can get value out of, out of you, that's when you get the job. But before you're comfortable in that, you need to have probably a couple of projects that you've developed yourself um, that, really kind of helps you to learn the skills that you're going to be using day in and day out. So I would focus on, you know, things that relate to generating business value and also things that relate to what your future employer is going to want, which is going to be, um, you know, obviously uh, probably applications being able to uh, 
digest and understand business problems and being able to provide actionable insights. Those are the three things you need to be able to have those taken care of. Um, otherwise that business won't be able to get value out of you. Okay, great. Um, Steven asks, uh, are GitHub repos and sites a good way to showcase your work or a, a personal website? Um, so showcasing your work, I mean, it's, it's kind of tough because like uh, on the one hand is an employer going to go through all of the different um, GitHub repos that for every, you know, um, student that they're going to get. So I think, I think GitHub's kind of a tough, tough one. Uh, I use GitHub to develop software. And if you have something that you've developed that is kind of noteworthy, I would definitely use that. Um, but if you have, if you're really just kind of use, using it as a place to store all of your code and stuff, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's a challenge. I, I wouldn't point a, um, a, uh, a potential employer to that. Uh, rather what I would do is I would focus on maybe one or two applications that you've developed, uh, and that you can speak intelligently about in an interview, um, and showcase some of the, uh, the tools that are, are in them that that company can use. So if you have an application developed that, you know, has like a GUI that that company and it doesn't have to, you know, obviously be exactly what the company can use, but as long as they can make the connection, like, oh yeah, that, that would be a good skill to have. Um, that's what I would try and develop as a portfolio. I think apps, I mean, they're, they make great sales pitches. They do because you get, you show them something that they can generate value from immediately. And they probably don't have that skill set internally, at least not with the speed that you'll be able to create them with. Perfect. Uh, let's see here. Trevor asks, which courses are recommended for mid-level R users? So mid-level R, R users, um, basically, uh, in, um, so this is the introductory course, the eight-week course, so that's the 101. Once you get like the tidyverse down, um, then kind of the intermediate would be this 201. 203 on the analytics end, and then on the web apps end, 102 is an intermediate course, and then uh, 202 is an advanced course. Um, if you already know, like this one goes over Flex, Flex Dashboard, which is kind of like an R Markdown uh, kind of uh, R Markdown method of making shiny apps, and then this one goes through you know all of the base using using the shiny program. Um, and then also how to do like AWS and, and that sort of thing. So depending on where you're, where you're at with shiny, um, you'll definitely want to do this one, this one, uh, and this one, and then maybe this one. Okay. Uh, so one thing to note, there are several questions on this. The courses are self paced. They don't expire. And there is a, a Slack community where every student, um, for, for the courses are in that Slack community as well. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. That's one of the big things too, that we're finding. And I, you know, I wanted to include that in the presentation as well as the fact that like the successful students that I'm seeing are also contributing, whether it's on LinkedIn to the overall data science community or in our own personal Slack channel. Um, a lot of them are answering questions. They're asking really thoughtful questions and they're interacting with the community. So that's, that's a really powerful way for you to develop yourself is to actually answer questions. And I think that uh, um, whether it's through our Slack channel or whether it's through like a program like LinkedIn, you know, it can be um, a really powerful way of growing yourself. Okay, great. Um, what's the average time? There's a, there's a lot of questions on how long does it take to get to the courses? Uh, so you might want to speak on that a little bit, Matt. Yeah, certainly. I mean, there's no shortcuts. That's the thing. Like if you want to try and do, if you, if you're looking for a program that you're going to be able to get a job in a week, it doesn't exist. I hate to say, I, I don't want to, you know, um, <laughs> upset anybody here, but, um, the, the thing is, is that it takes people when they learn, it takes them time to understand concepts and not everything clicks right away. So 
what the, what I recommend doing is doing five to 10 hours per week of assignments. And then that way you can still, you know, whether or not you've got a, a, a job or if you've got, you know, interviews that you're preparing for or those sorts of things, you can still do all of that kind of in, in the, at the same time that you're, you're taking these courses. The, 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 why this works is because you can begin applying your information to a project immediately. So when you start taking this 101 course, most of my successful students are also have a, have a project in mind that they want to complete in parallel with it. So they're not just taking the, the course, but they're kind of, you know, they'll, they'll hit, hit pause maybe for a little bit and then they'll develop their own project and then they'll come back. So that's whether or not you already have a job and you're looking to make a career transition. Um, that's an effective approach. Or if you're just starting out and you, and you um, want to, you know, really kind of get through the program as quickly as possible, you can probably increase it to 20 or 30 hours per week and that'll accelerate it. But when you start going beyond that, it ends up being something that, you know, you just information overload because you're learning a lot throughout these programs. And then also it's, it just takes a long, a little bit of time to get through each one of these. This, this eight week course has probably 30 to 40 hours worth of content. And that's a, that's a lot of videos and then you got to think you're going to be pausing and you're going to have to write your own code because you're following along with me. So at least triple that. And that's probably how many hours it's going to take you to get through, you know, each one of these different courses. All right. Here's a good question. Uh, so what's the, I can't pronounce your name. I guess it's Injo. Injo asks, um, what about the competition? For example, why would I not buy data camp for $25 per month? It's a good question. Yeah. I mean, it, it is a good question. Uh, and you know, I, I think the world of all of the comp the competition, the space there, you know, there's a lot of different companies out there that are all serve a purpose. Um, the problem with data camp and the problem with some of these other ones is you're probably not going to get to the level that you want to, to be at. And you're going to have maybe some fun with the courses uh, and because I know that they do the gamification and, and those sorts of things. But when it comes down to it, at the end of the day, you need to be able to get a job and you need to be able to focus on business value. That's, that's where I focus. And I also teach all of the advanced tools that are going to be able to um, get you that, that role. Uh, chances are you're probably not going to learn, you know, things like AWS, Docker, Git. You may learn some of those kind of independently, but you're probably not going to do a full scale project through data camp. Um, again, these courses, they take probably 40 hours to complete. Uh, and most of, of the, comp, the competitor courses are probably three or four hour courses. Also, the other thing I don't like is that a lot of them are not real world. And what I mean by that is you're typing code into an editor that's in, in your, you know, on, on the um, computer. It's not the actual editor that you're going to be working with and you're not actually going down through and solving a problem like you would in the real world. So when you get out there and you try and translate what you've learned, to what the what the real world looks like, um, you know. Sometimes uh, there's a little bit of frustration. I can imagine that that goes on with that. So you get what you pay for. Um, but at the end of the day, I know, I stand behind my program and I stand behind the results that uh, my students are getting, and, and and it's been pretty effective so far. Yeah, if I could just add on to that really quick. Um, like Matt said, each each um, each online program has their their pros and cons, you know, has their purpose. One thing that is a differentiator for business science is it uses this business science um, problem framework. So it's all about teaching data science in a workflow that's going to help you solve real world business problems. At the same time, you're learning how to use the tools, programming, algorithms, um, you know, the libraries, you're learning all of that hands on. So we didn't do any coding here, but um, on a lot of Matt's uh, uh, live videos, he walks you through the code and the, and the courses are the same way. So all the videos, the code is actually being coded right in front of you. The concepts are being taught in front of you. And you, you basically should have your 
coding environment up doing a doing it along with the videos so it's a it's a much different feel than say a data camp or you know udemy or, or some of the other ones um and then the other thing this is a framework if you look here at the five course r track system each um each course kind of builds onto the next now you don't depending on your level of expertise you don't have to have previous ones if you're you know intermediate but if you're just starting out start at the beginning with the 101 course and that builds on to the next course and to the next so it's a framework to help you understand how to use data science to solve real world business problems and from what we've seen uh, nobody else is doing it like this and we're trying to make it so that you have one place to go to do all of your learning and you know and then we also have other other ways to um, teach specific topics through our learning labs. Yeah, and, and I'll I, give you guys a little bit more information. Yeah, and I appreciate you bringing that up. The one of the things that you said, you know, I, I forgot to mention was the integration too. Um, this this whole system builds on on each other, whereas um, you know the the data camps and they're all made by independent instructors which is also good because you get different perspectives, but it can hurt because when you take a track on like a data camp, you know, those instructors aren't talking to each other and they aren't building a system that's going to teach you all of the integration and, and how things kind of mesh together when it comes to learning, you know, from the first course to the second course, you know, I'm making sure that I'm not overlapping, you know, teaching the same thing twice. And I'm also making sure that you're getting specifically the things that you need to learn in order to be able to be successful. I've been doing this for a while. I've been teaching a lot of students. I now have over 1700. Um, just last week I hopped on a, uh, or I had a presentation teaching model time and time TK to Apple, uh, their, their time series forecasting data science team. Um, you know, so I know what I'm doing um, and I know that this program can help you. And more importantly than, than me saying that, I think it's, I think it's the, the results that the students are getting that really vouch for me. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Okay. Um, let's see, we've answered that question. Hmm. If you guys have any more questions, particularly a question that's not been answered already, please do put it in the chat. Um, so Trevor asks, what about updates to Tidyverse and other packages? How do, how do, how do we, um, will, the, will the content be updated to, change, to these changes? So what I basically do, the, the coursework is, um, is kept up to date through the checkpoint files. So as we have issues, we keep a, an updated version uh, version controlled with each of the checkpoint files. Mm -hmm. So you're going to make make sure that you have working code. Um, the uh, the other thing too is that as these programs evolve over time, that there's kind of this idea here that you the core generally stays the same, but the advanced features, you know, there's definitely a, a certain level of advanced features and functionality and, and things that come out of that. So there's actually a different product that I haven't really focused on because I don't think it's the right product to talk about here. But I also do what's called Learning Labs Pro, and that's geared towards my intermediate and advanced data scientists and somebody and and people that have definitely completed the first course or or are beyond that level of. Um, you know, in their, in their progression, in their journey. Um, and what that product does is it gives them every two weeks a new uh, presentation, a new uh, coding uh, lesson. And that's really cool because it gives them variety of these new things that are coming out. It showcases, it always showcases, you know, the latest and greatest. Um, and that's really kind of how you continue to learn long after you've, you've gone through the program. So the, the goal with the core curriculum is to give you the essential things that are going to really help you in your career. The goal with the learning labs is, is once you've got your job to help keep you continue learning and accelerate your career. Um, 
and the, and the results speak for, for themselves. Uh, I didn't put, there's a, there's actually another case study that I have. Um, his name is Mohana, uh, Christian or, uh, Chitur, Krish, uh, I'm mispronouncing his name, but anyways, uh, Mahana, he's doing a tremendous job. He, uh, he got several promotions within just the span of a year and ended up getting over a 40% raise, uh, because some of the, the learnings that he was learning over time through the, the business science program. And this is what happens when you start to really, um, not just stop learning once you get your job, but when you continue to develop yourself, your career just takes off and it's, and it's an amazing thing. And I'm so happy for him because like, and all of these students that are doing well, because that's, that's really what makes me feel good at the end of the day is, and that's what I, what I pride myself in is, is not what I do, but it's what my, my students do. Okay, great. Uh, James been eagerly waiting his question. So let's right. see here. Let's, let's, kind of let's help James. Let's help James. I'm going to try to paraphrase it because there's some information here, but he's, um, he's, a, BA, he's a, a business science student. Uh, he says he might be going backwards through the order of the courses, but planning on taking the time series and machine learning course next. Mm -hmm. So he's a biostatistics PhD student, hopes to land a job, a data science job uh, at the end of next year. And he's asking, is it doable? He's saying, is it doable? I'm, gu I'm, I'm guessing that means, is getting the job doable if I go through the forecasting and machine learning course? Is there anything else I should add like Spark or another ML tool? Before you answer that, Matt, I think mm -hmm. there, does, there do seem to be questions that revolve around um, being very specific, like, should I do this? for this outcome. Mm -hmm. And I, I think, I know the, I know you the way you'll answer this will help James out, but if you could phrase it in such a way to help others understand, it's not so much about the specific technology. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. That, that's, that's what I was thinking is, you know, so, so for, for James's question, let me paraphrase it first. Um, the way I'm interpreting it, and correct me if I'm wrong, David, is that there's a lot of tools out there. Um, should I learn tool X in order to be able to get me a job? Yeah. And, and specifically he's, he's taking the, uh, I think the web apps course. Okay. But he wants to know, should he take time series or machine learning for this data science job that he hopes to get? Yeah. So, so the, um, the way I'll, I'll phrase that and, and the most important things end up being how you are able to digest the business problem and how you're able to, so that's the, at the beginning of the process and how you're able to extract business value at the end of it. The stuff in the middle, you know, is important, but you need to have a process in order to be able to kind of get you from that point A to point B. Um, that is what this business science framework does. So if I go back here, it's this thing. This is one of the, I would say the most important things. Um, we saw it too here where the students that were getting the jobs, they, they had um, leveraged, smartly leveraged this, this um, framework, but kind of in a, in a, in a way that helped them answer the problems that they were getting in the, in the, um, in, in the interview. And then uh, the other thing too is, you know, whether or not you take, which course you take depends on very specifically which role you're, you're shooting for. Um, so if it's a forecasting role, I would recommend the time series course. So there's the, the, the time series course, which does this, and it gives you kind of a framework, a pathway to solve forecasting problems, which are a specific type of problem that a lot of businesses um, have and they can save a lot of money if they can more accurately forecast or better you know, understand the, the confidence of their forecast. So that, that's why I would say take that one if you're specifically looking for a forecasting role or, or if you know that the company that you're looking at applying to needs that type of skill. Now, conversely, if you are specifically looking at more of a general business problem, 
I would say this course here, the 201 is more important because that actually goes through the whole framework of, of doing kind of like a, I call it a large scale data science project, but it's, it's when I say large scale, it, it has a lot of zeros attached to it, meaning that, that the dollar figure that's, that's assigned to it is, is pretty large. I think it's like 10 million per year or something like that, which is a, a, an organizational and HR issue that's costing them, them money. Um, that is the type of thing that you can immediately, you can talk very intelligently about it in the interview process, but more importantly, you see how all of the stages kind of fit together and when you need to talk with the organization, when you need to collect information, when you need to um, meet with different teams uh, at the beginning of the process and, and how you kind of move through this kind of step by step and, and, and where there should be a gate, you, you need to have a stop, you need to have X, Y, and Z taken care of before you move on with the process. So that, that can help you definitely big time if you're going for more of a general business type of role. Okay. Thanks for that, Matt. Uh, Brian asks, I recently finished 101, currently enrolled in 102. In what order should I take the last three courses? It, I mean, it depends what you like. Uh, so the, the only requirement for the rest of these courses is the 101 uh, is a prereq for this one and the, and the prereq for this one. And then uh, the prereq for this one is the 101 and the 102. So um, you can... I would say whatever your interest is or whatever your business need is. So I would, I would talk with you, you know, if you're, if you're in a position with a company, figure out what they need first. And, and I would go after that. Okay. That's great. Um, you're welcome, Brian. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, so this is an anonymous question. How important is it to learn web development as a data scientist, particularly in building the business applications you've mentioned? So how, how important, I'm sorry, I missed that. How important, how important is it to be a web, to learn web development? To mm -hmm. learn web development? So uh, this, this is just based on my perspective. Honestly, um, I think it's really important to learn web technology at least a little bit. Uh, HTML and CSS ends up being pretty important because when you, you know, it depends what, what you aspire to do, but um, most organizations really can benefit from some form of web app. Whether or not you do it with Shiny, doesn't really matter. Whether or not you do it with a Python framework like Flask or, or something like that. Um, but you need to be comfortable with, you need to understand how, how a website is structured in order to effectively make UI and, you know, even, even something like uh, what this was right here. Um, so this, this app, this is Herb's app. So he had to know, he didn't have to know, like he, he built this after I think one or two months of uh, being with business science. So it's not, I'm not talking a significant time investment. He took the 102 course and what he did was he kind of took his business problem and kind of fit it into how that course is structured. You know, it teaches you how to make a, a flex dashboard app that has the sidebar on the left, uh, each of these components here, each of these value boxes up here. And then he added some additional stuff down here, but it's really, once you get the basics behind it, then you're, you're pretty solid. You don't necessarily need to go to the level that Raj did with his app. Now, keep in mind, this is a, a competition win winning application where uh, it connects to an API, it does all of this. That's in the 202 course. So I would say it's very important to learn HTML uh, just because um, organizations want applications like these. Uh, the data science team is gonna be well suited to, to produce these. Um, but depending on where you want to go with it, you don't necessarily need to dedicate a whole lot of time to it. Um, you can, you can be satisfied just, you know, if, if you only ever need to build apps like this, just, just with the 102 course content, uh, or learning flex dashboard in general. Um, or you can go kind of full scale and, and start building some of these more high end applications. So one thing to, to piggyback on that, one thing to think about is uh, there's this whole concept of being a T-shaped professional. So it's like a, like the letter T. And mm -hmm. then the top line, you have 
your general um, knowledge. So that could be, you know, wrangling data, machine learning, time series, and all of this. Mm -hmm. And uh, the bottom line is where you decide to go deep. And web technologies right. is one of those where you should have it on your general knowledge because it makes you a little bit more well-rounded. Um, and I think this also applies to some of the questions we had about which, which should I focus on? So if you're a beginner, focus on learning the foundation, uh, getting, getting your foundational data science knowledge and experience intact. And then once you're introduced into the industry of data science or the field of data science, you'll start to see areas that you can specialize in. It's hard for us to tell you what you should specialize in when we don't know anything about you, your background, your interests, and you don't know a lot about the field to, to be comfortable in saying what you would enjoy and what you would. Yeah, I, I agree with that 100%, David. I think that's such a smart answer because like the foundation, if you're just starting out, you shouldn't be learning HTML. Um, down the road, I think it's, I think it's important, but, but my, my uh, response is skewed because I know that like mm -hmm. when I was consulting, shiny apps was a thing that businesses would be you know, willing to pay good money for and, and because there's a, a, a need for it. Um, conversely, if your organization has n absolutely no interest in, in having web applications, then it doesn't really make sense for you to spend a whole lot of time on it. You know, definitely a good skill to learn down the road, but start with the, the, uh, the, begin the foundational content first. All right, great. So let's see. Well, we did have one question on the roadmap for business science. Like what's next? What's coming in 2021? Mm, okay, that's a good question. Um, so my gut feel is that uh, Python is, is the next one. And I'm, I'm saying that, but it's gonna be a Python for our users. It's not gonna be just a straight Python course. I think, um, what I want to do is I really want to show the power of utilizing the two languages together. Uh, and this is something that I've gotten very familiar with over the past month or two, because I've actually developed an R package uh, that integrates a Python package. And I've seen the power of being able to create bindings in R. Uh, and, and all that means is it just create a, a way to connect up with the Python package. And, um, but in order to do that, you have to know a little bit about Python. Um, I think I think that that's that's a smart way to go because it really helps take the R track then to the next level. It starts helping the students that have already invested time and energy learning R, and it helps them continue to develop uh, now a, a core skill set, which is going to be Python. And it also helps them work in a data science team where they may be using R or they may be using Python. It teaches them kind of how to, how to leverage the strengths of both languages. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let's do just a couple more questions here. James is following up on his previous one. James is, is our, our bio statistician. I think that's what he's getting his PhD in. Mm -hmm. Um, to sum up his question, he's asking, where does he get ideas for portfolio projects? So if yeah. he wants to apply to a partic particular industry, how does he come up with an idea for something that would be a good, a good for a portfolio? Sure. So the, the way I did it is, um, and this is, this is actually how I got the idea for Business Science University. This, and this is like five years ago now. Um, uh, yeah, five, it was 2000, end of 2016. So I, um, I was taking at that point in time, the, uh, uh, it was on Coursera. It was, it was like one of the only data science boot camps that was out there at the time. It was, um, the John Hopkins, uh, one. And I was like really close to completing it. And I got this idea, like, the light bulb just went off in my head because I was working on a, a financial project for my own personal benefit. Um, cause I was, I'm, I'm interested in stocks and, and portfolio analysis and primarily reducing risk while still maintaining a good level of return. And, um, 
I got this bright idea because I was constantly playing around with uh, this package called Quant Mod, and um, and and what I was struggling with is I kept having to switch back and forth between data frames because I was using dplyr in the tidyverse, uh, and then I would switch over to this thing called XTS, which is what Quant Mod uses, and then I'd have to switch back, and then I'd have to like pivot all my data because the formatting wasn't right for the tidy data structure. So uh, long story short, I ended up getting a bright idea. I was like, well, what if I create kind of like a simple wrapper to quant mod called, you know, I'll call it tidy quant because it, what it would do is internally just kind of manipulate the data to be able to run the, the quant mod stuff on it and then uh, kind of put it back in the, in the, in the right format. So I, I never had to leave the data frame structure. And, um, and that's how I got the idea for my, my first project. Now, this wasn't something that like, you know, may interest you as a professional, you may have no interest in stock analysis, but for me, it was pretty cool because I was, you know, I had to learn our package development. I had to learn, um, uh, how to kind of build functions. I had to learn, you know, just kind of basic things, foundational things that were pretty important and especially as a data scientist. And then, you know, I opened, I put it, I put the package out there and uh, fast forward uh, five years now or four, four or five years. And uh, it's already, it's been downloaded over a half a million times and people are getting some benefit out of it. So it's, uh, you know, pretty cool. Um, feel, feels good. Like I'm giving back, but also it was kind of really important for me to have a project like that where I developed, you know, my own thing. And, uh, and it was based on off an interest. Okay. So we're going to do three more questions. Um, going to wrap up, uh, two questions into one, cause I think they're closely related, but Alfred asks, I think this is a great question. How useful is data science for those in strategic leadership? Ooh, that's a good one. That is, uh, um, so, uh, I think I always found, um, you know, it depends on who you are. If you like code, like the problem is, is that most people in, in leadership are there because they, they don't like probably like code and, and that sort of thing. Um, I'll give you another story. Uh, the last company that I worked for before I, I quit and, and started business science, uh, I, um, I, I ended up, I was, I was in kind of one of those roles where it was a, a leadership role, uh, managing a, a team of, uh, like 60 people or so in a couple of different departments. And, um, the, the thing that I found very useful from data science is the fact that I could organize insights and provide information, action, the actionable insights that I've been talking about in this presentation. I could extract those from databases that I could never, you know, um, try and use Excel for because Excel, Excel has a limitation where at least it did back then where you have about a million rows of data and, and your, uh, computer gives you the blue screen of death is what I called it or what, what it's, I think is known as basically your, your, your laptop overloads and your, your Ram shuts it down. So, uh, I found data science very, very useful for those type of problems where I was traditionally using Excel and it gave me a way to get beyond the limitation of Excel, which was to get to go after these larger and larger data sets and that database. I mean, I'm sure it's got like 5 million records in it now. So, I mean, not a huge database, but for our, you know, it'll slice and dice it, but for Excel, you know, it broke down. Um, Going beyond, you know, that sort of use case, um, it, de it depends. I mean, if you're in charge of leading, leading a part of the organization that deals with some of these metrics like customers and those sorts of things, adding data science to your toolkit can really help you to be able to identify need areas like things you should be working on or things that are customers you should be focusing on. Um, you can create automations that are really powerful that'll actually um, speed up your productivity. Um, I know when I was working, uh, when I first got my kind of leadership position, I was spending probably 20 hours a week 
just meeting with teams and talking about, you know, the problems that they were running into and the automations I was able to develop just using simple things like Microsoft Access uh, back then. Uh, but but now you'd use a, 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 da- a better database for it and create like a GUI with uh, a shiny app. I mean, that's that saved me probably 15, 20 hours a week there. Um, so it's really powerful for automating your stuff, uh, your, your, your kind of time consuming efforts. And then also um, uh, doing getting getting beyond some of the limitations with Excel. Definitely. And then also in the, in the strategic leadership point, uh, understanding that business science problem framework, uh, how these projects are structured, like from beginning to end, how you go about um, how you go about solving problems and the resources required to do that. I think that's important as well. Yeah, that, that, that's, a, that's a really good point, David. The, uh, the business science fr- problem framework for a leadership position can really help with um, organizing the teams correctly, making sure you have the right departments involved, making sure that you know kind of each step in the process, and more importantly, not you, but the whole, everyone involved knows what the process is and, uh, and the steps that you wanna go through in order to solve your project. Definitely. Okay, so Samantha, and Michael, we're gonna we're gonna group your your questions together. So this is about Shiny. I'm sorry, Smitha. I said Samantha. Smitha, sorry about that. Um, so the question is about the trends of drag and drop data tools like Tableau, Click, you know, some of these other ones, Power BI, and how in the future of say Shiny, um, how does What's the future of Shiny look like with the trend of sort of drag and drop easy to use tools in the in the marketplace? Okay, yeah, that's a good question. So um, the way I would phrase it is the way that I would phrase anything. So if you view like Python and R as competitors, which a lot of people do, then you feel like it's one or the other. But the problem becomes is that when you start looking closer at some of these languages and some of these tools that are out there you'll notice that each one has strengths and weaknesses. And that's really important to be able to understand what those are because then you have the right tool for the job. So um, from the standpoint of Tableau and Power BI, those are pretty much direct replacements for each other. But when you you have uh, a Shiny or Flask in this category, those aren't 100% direct replacements. Because what Shiny does is it allows you to integrate predictive technologies so you actually have R, an R server running underneath the hood that real time when somebody pings your app, pings a server, runs a, uh, a machine learning algorithm or something like that and actually spits out results. Whereas with Tableau, it's a little bit um, more convoluted than that. So you can have an R process that you can connect up to it. I've heard that it's uh, only has so much flexibility. Um, so if you're trying to run real time predictive, um, get real time predictive results, it becomes a real challenge. So I view Power BI and Tableau until they do a lot of work in order to be able to upgrade their ability to interface with Python and R. Um, I view them more as descriptive tools. You know, they're nice for slicing and dicing data, kind of like Excel is with with um, pivot tables and pivot charts. But when you start talking about actually providing your company predictive insights or your customer predictive insights, that's where Shiny and and other tools really set themselves apart. And on top of that, keep in mind, Shiny is a a, uh, full stack web application framework. Tableau and, and Power BI are not. So in order to be able to develop more sophisticated applications, Shiny is a clear winner there. I think that's a great point. I like the way you made the distinction uh, between the tools and it's not always about one or the other. Mm -hmm. Um, And then one thing I'll say to to the questions, the way they were phrased was this, uh, I'm seeing a declining trend. Um, You got to be careful about what the stuff you're seeing online. It's not always reflective of industry. 
Um, and, you know, there's, there's a lot of sort of niche categories as well that are not represented, you know, in these uh, surveys and stuff that are put out there. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you're in the R environment, if you're in the R ecosystem, then Shiny is definitely a clear winner for creating reproducible, predictive web apps. It's no question about it. Yeah, for, for sure. Um, I'm not seeing any trends uh, that are uh, hurting the prospects of Shiny. If anything, I'm seeing, I'm excited about the prospects because uh, our studio is doing a really great job developing their enterprise products. And a lot of companies are starting to adopt those. Um, and they're, and our studio just keeps on hiring people. So that's an indicator that they're, they're doing things right. Yep, definitely. Okay, guys, I think we're going to wrap it up here. We want to be respectful of uh, everyone's time. Um, we really do appreciate everyone joining us today. Um, I'll throw the link to the courses in the chat once more. And Matt, do you have any parting words? No, I'm just thankful that everyone attended and it sounded like uh, this presentation was a success. So uh, I'm glad that, you know, it's not my, it's not my normal presentation. So I was a little uh, unsure, you know, how it was going to go, but it seems like, you know, everyone had, had some good questions and thoughtful questions. Yeah. The chat's been uh, very, very active and we, we do appreciate everyone for taking the hour and a half out of your day to, and joining us today. Yes. It's a lot of fun. So Absolutely. Thank yeah. Thank you so much for your time and uh, we'll see you next time. Okay. Yeah. You guys take care. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye.